We need to find new ways of uh, living together, and that is where I'm looking for in my work. I still believe in bettering the world and society through technology. Well, I think the economy is one reason why people are trying to downsize, because things are so expensive. You use already manufactured objects, and you bring it uh, in, into the architecture, so it's like ready-made in architecture. A lot of people just don't like the fact that they've been essentially forced into larger spaces than they actually want to be in. We have to reappropriate existing things, make new values out of this garbage. There's no question in my mind that you know something that is more compact is a smarter way to build. Now what we can do is we can use all of this trash, which is damaging the ecology, and turn it into something really beneficial. I think I'm trying to create a better world. And in order to do that, we have to experiment and try out uh, other ways of, uh, of living. I find it very interesting to look at something and imagine what its next life would become. Given my interest in mobility, I've always looked at structures that are outside of architecture that move. Part of my thinking has to do with you know, the, the nature of being human and what does that entail. To some degree, we have this desire to hold memory. And um, often, our memories are stored in our attics, because they, they are kind of embedded within the objects that we own. Uh, but now, memory can just be stored on a hard drive. So we can dispose or do away with the collection of stuff and uh, live more lightly. As humans, I really feel like, you know, we were not meant to be sedentary. Constantly when I travel, I'm always drawn to the people that are building with makeshift construction pieces or using wheels in unusual ways. And I looked further and further into that and found that there's an incredible history of uh, mobile lifestyles, and it became my passion. Recently, I took an old truck trailer and craned it in over my house and attached it to the back, a structure that might not be roadworthy anymore, and rethought how I could skin it, how I could create openings in it, and make a contribution to a dwelling that then could also be moved and relocated as needed. I get really excited when I'm driving down the freeway and I see a truck go by and I immediately start to fantasize about how that could become part of a house or it could become, you know, a, a mobile library. There's a tremendous amount of industrial materials that are out in the landscape that can be redeployed in a variety of different ways. And for example, the shipping container is a, is a terrific example. I'm not spending energy on creating it from scratch, but I'm repurposing it for another use. The Joshua Tree Prefab is a modular home sits out on the desert floor and is a fully self-sufficient structure where it is not attached to the electrical grid and is not attached to the water system. It is a very simple building that is really meant to allow you to sleep, to eat, and to relax that then can be moved from location to location at the snap of a finger.
I would say that you know there absolutely is a movement that is pervasive throughout this country where people are looking to be able to create their environments without having rules thrust upon them. Within that thinking, there's a difference in terms of scale. So it's less about bigger is better and more about you know, smaller is smarter. And that is connected to the dwelling that we have around us. So you know, the less stuff we have, the lighter the materials are, the smarter they become, the less encumbered we become as people. The buildings that I create are not large, and yet they also, they have a sense of volume to them. You know, they have natural light, they have ceilings that are, that tend to be higher than conventional houses, so, so that you feel expansive in terms of height, but not necessarily in terms of width. If you can look outside and be connected to a natural environment outside, you are expanding your space, you know, visually, but not necessarily physically. You know, innately as a human being, we are nomadic and we're mobile and we're curious. And uh, we will always be, you know, exploring. Whether it's here in the desert or whether it's, you know, out in space or uh, in the ocean, we can't just let that go. When I look at what I consider to be beautiful in the world, it's what is necessary. You know, when, you, when something is truly necessary, it becomes vital and it seems important and it seems beautiful. The average American house puts out like 18 tons worth of greenhouse gases per year, consumes about a quarter acre of woodland, puts another seven tons of construction waste into the local landfill. So. Um, I wanted to contribute to that as little as I had to and still have a great place to live. You know, I never did uh, any building until I decided to live small. And I couldn't really afford to have anybody else build for me, so I built my own house. And that's how I learned to do it, just by doing. I've actually lived in four tiny houses of about this size. Uh, the first one was pretty much exactly this size. The second one, when I moved to California where the land prices are expensive, I wanted to make sure my house was small enough that I could parallel park it by hand if I had to live on the street. Uh, it turned out I didn't have to live on the street, so I sold that one and built a, another larger one. And then finally this one. So the first step to designing a very small, efficient space seems to be figuring out what you actually need and then getting rid of everything. So in my case, for example, I don't cook very much at all. So my counter is only three and a half feet long. If I cooked a lot, I might turn the whole house into a kitchen. But it's a matter of deciding what you need to do to be happy and then accommodating for that. Because if you're not, I guess the, down, the, the other side of living simply is living too simply, perhaps, and not having what you need, which isn't good either. The laws in the US say you can't build a house that's too small. There are a few different rules in there that, that apply. You gotta have a room of 120 square feet. Any bedroom has to be at least 70 square feet. When you add it all up, it's bigger than I actually wanted. So by putting a house on wheels, it's no longer a building. It doesn't have to abide by building codes. Um, and you can build it as small as you want. You just can't go too big because otherwise you're probably gonna hit a bridge when you're driving down the road.
it, it is sort of a countercultural thing. I think uh, a lot of people just don't like the fact that they've been essentially forced into larger spaces than they actually want to be in. So besides just being um, environmental and uh, economic, this whole thing is also sort of a um, civil disobedience act. It's a, a way of getting around the, the forces that have forced people into more house than they actually have wanted or needed in the past. I hope to build a village within the next couple years in this county so people don't always have to fight the codes and the zoning laws. They can just live in a tiny house village, which will probably be zoned as a trailer park, oddly enough. Um, I've never really thought of myself as a trailer park type of person, but this won't be a, your average trailer park. It'll be lots of pedestrian walkways, cars out back, and uh, some, sh it'll basically be co-housing for the antisocial, you know, like shared some things, but lots of privacy in your little houses too. I can fit a bed downstairs, but if I put a bed downstairs, I don't have, I mean, that takes up a lot of space. So I just, um, I go up. I like to use vertical space as much as possible to make uh, things really efficient. A house in which there's a lot of wasted space just doesn't feel vital. And you fill it with a bunch of stuff you don't really need, life itself seems diminished a bit. So in a house where everything is necessary, life itself seems very necessary. And yeah, I feel very much more alive in a small place. The reason why I'm doing this project is because it's something that I believe that is really necessary with the way that uh, civilization is growing over the planet, and it's something that can really heal the ecology of the planet. Coming from a town in the north of England where there's quite a bit of pollution, a lot of industry, I was always uh, quite interested in the uh, ecology from an early age. This idea came over a number of years when I was in my 30s after thinking deeply about spiritual things and also ecological uh, state of the planet and what the future could be with more people all the time and more trees getting cut down. This idea came to actually grow plants and use the trash to uh, create a base for a floating garden that just keeps getting stronger with time. Making land out of um, plastic bottles and trash, and it's this whole island with the house included, is about 70% recycled. So I've got really quite a comfortable home. The way I begin to build the island, it's just so simple. You take one shipping pallet, and then you get the bags of bottles and, uh, and just put them on the back and, and tie them together. When a plastic bottle is underneath a floating island in, in cool water uh, where the sun isn't getting on it, it could last for thousands of years. We don't really know, but we do know it lasts a lot longer. And I actually took a bag out after many years of, because I've been doing this five years, and so I've checked and corals are growing underneath on them. And the tops get corals, so you can't even take the tops off afterwards. 
And the idea is that it can get big enough and strong enough to actually go on the ocean and float down and eventually go through the Panama Canal and out onto the Pacific. It's not like a boat. Boats are solid and they rock like this. And it's a different thing. An island, because it's all flexible, the wave comes through. So the island actually rolls. So I say boats rock, but islands roll. There's many ways to use and recycle and make wonderful homes. And you know, you put your love in it and the love comes back and other people who visit enjoy it as well so much. So this is a shower that comes from partially from rainfall. It's creating more uniqueness instead of having like the old houses out of tiki-taki, you know, everyone the same, ba ba ba. Variety in life, I think, is really, really important. I've noticed that since I uh, kind of dropped out a little bit from doing the regular job, my life, I can flow and feel, you know, the spirit just taking me one way or the other. And as I do what I, what I choose to do, my energy flows into that and, and actually produces something uh, more beautiful and, and there's more satisfaction. Now what we can do is we can use all of this trash, which is damaging the ecology, and turn it into something really beneficial to the whole planet. Create more oxygen, filter the water, clean the water, put the trash underneath, and create more surface area for people to live on. We can heal the whole ecology of the world using trash. I try to understand what would the uh, uh, culture of the next city be. The city is not what we see now. It's a kind of image that we see of the city, but it's not, let's say, it does not correspond to its function anymore. So you do not have the same function of the street, of the piazza, or of uh, the urban space. And I'm very interested about this condition that uh, started after the internet, so it's a kind of... Uh, post-network uh, culture that has to do with uh, the idea of uh, creating ensembles through a kind of populations of fragmented units. The crane rooms do not have a roof. Uh, they are uh, open-air structures. They can function in favorable weather conditions. And uh, they are there in order to take advantages of open air life. They can orient themselves towards the view that is preferred. But uh, because of their height, they are isolated rooms, finally. So when the crane rooms are up and they observe their nature, let's say. It's, a, it's also another, another screen. They show nature not uh, as a function, but only as an image. Nature is, is a construction 
that has to do with an exotic view for me. There is a naive understanding of nature in what we know today as uh, a return to nature. I, I'm very distant to the idea of uh, making nature a new god. In this phase of architecture, we will not have to create out of scratch, to reorder it, to make new values out of this garbage. In the cake apartment, uh, I tried to reuse uh, vehicles that I was always seeing in the National Road, and I was thinking that there is a huge space inside them, so I thought that it would be really interesting to be inhabited, in a way. And I was always thinking about those windows that would be open to the sky, how it will feel to be inside. So it's kind of small prison cell in a way. It is, it's a cell where somebody confines himself voluntarily. We can be inside smaller spaces with, without having the idea that we are in smaller spaces. And uh, because our uh, window is now a screen that can change uh, endlessly. Internet poses the condition of uh, a new minimalism. This changes the architecture of what house is or what a house would be. The space that one needs uh, in order to observe his screen is the space, the minimum space of today. The idea in concrete beds has to do with uh, the concept of uh, understanding the internet in a barbarian sense. Cave society where infrastructure is hidden, but what we need is only uh, a place to sleep. Internet and a cave. We do not uh, go towards a more complex civilization, but we go backwards towards a cave society. It just might be that, you know, out here, we're just not surrounded by all the stuff that's in cities, and it just makes you appreciate people more because you're not inundated with, with stimuli by, from every direction. And it's like my, my house in upstate New York, my property taxes alone were $12,000 a year. And um, just, you know, to sustain all that stuff can be really expensive. And to be able to just figure out what you really need and scale it back a little bit, it makes all the rest of life easier. Uh, I worked in photography for about six or seven years in fashion photography, and then I, I, I got kind of tired of fashion, so I, I went on to uh, set and prop building. I did that for about 10 years, got tired of that, just got tired of being around that many people all the time. Since I didn't have a family, I didn't have a wife, kids, and it was 
I could do anything I wanted. I started thinking about how much room did I really need to live in? And it's kind of strange because I lived in a 2,800 square feet and now I live in 128 square feet. When I was six or seven years old, I used to think I wanted to be a hermit when I grew up. So this is perfect because five or six days will go by and I won't see another human. And uh, I don't really mind that too much. There it is. Almost gone. Oh, it's gone. It's gone, buddy. It's gone. It's all gone. Yes, it is. One of the other things that I thought about quite a bit was I wanted to do it all myself. So I've done all the construction by myself on my house, both my house and the greenhouse. I don't really have a schedule out here, so. But there's always something to do, and then there's always plenty of time to sit back and relax. My uh, water collection system is, uh, I've got a huge greenhouse roof that has gutters on it, so when it rains, it collects in the gutters and it goes into big storage tanks. I experimented with off-grid living a little bit before I left upstate New York. I had a little camp I'd set up and I'd live out there during the summers and rent my big farmhouse out to folks from New York City that wanted a weekend place for the summer. And I'd learned to not really make sacrifices, but just learned a different way of living where you don't <clears throat> constantly need electricity pouring out of every corner of your house. For me, it was more about living a simple lifestyle and living debt-free, and it's kind of like being a high-tech pioneer. Especially in, in the way the world is just so crazy now with so much going on, it, it's nice to be able to try to see how much of my own needs I can really provide for myself. I do have a phone line that provides my phone and my uh, internet access. But other than that, I'm disconnected. Although I'm not really a hermit because, you know, I have as many as 50 people watching one of my webcams every day. I've got 1,300 people reading my blog every day. I get input and feedback on things I'm doing, but from a distance. I don't have to be around them, and I, I kind of appreciate that. The quiet is unimaginable. It's just so quiet out here. And I remember when I first moved to New York City how I couldn't go to sleep tonight because of the noise, but it wasn't because of the noise, but it was because something was going on and I was missing something. And now it's like the complete opposite. You know, I'm not missing a thing except this beautiful quiet I'm listening to. There's a, like a very uh, vicious way about uh, the web. It's that it really subtracts us, but in the same time, it opens us. As we're always reachable, with always our own building, finally. And it brings us back to some of our roots. We can be all together, but by yourself. 
finally today, if you think about a housing, what is it? It's a, it's a, it's a closet. It's something that you can find anywhere except that it's getting sentimental because you can have everything that you have in a, in a house, you can have it elsewhere. You can eat better in a restaurant, you can have a better, uh, you, can, you can wash yourself much better in, in a spa and then you have, and all those elements are, are offered in the city. But still, we still his, uh, think as, a, as the, how the housing as the only shelter that we could have and it's just uh, basically very, uh, just very emotional. Because out of that, when you think about it, it's just full of objects that you bring that are just memories. But uh, out of that, it can be anywhere. I started in uh, 87 around graffiti. Uh, when I used to paint as a graffiti artist, I was always chasing spots in the city, neglecting spots. But I was going intuitively into a field that I carry on exploring now because all of those spots are all the spots that I organize my architecture, installation and works around. We're going to be facing in the next 20, 30 years, really huge amount of people that will come in the city. The point is that architects today are only bound to answer to competition most of the time. And the problem about the competition is that it never asks the why. How can we build an alternative way? In France, we have like a very long tradition of strike. It really came from the roots of social, uh, social events, because finally uh, people do a lot of uh, striking in France, but at the end of the day, maybe sometimes they sit, and then after they go. The auto-defense project is a place for them to settle down and to try to recreate a new social scenario. So the idea is to create a city within the city to create a pocket of resistance that could grow inside the city. You use already manufactured objects and you, and you bring it uh, in, into the architecture. So it's like ready-made in architecture. Prefab units that you use on construction site because it's very fast, it's very cheap, installations are done. All of those elements can come there by trucks, and then it could really grow into a larger pocket, and it could grow to, to something very strong. So it's more about uh, a strategy than a form. I think it's not relevant so much anymore to destroy the buildings, because when you destroy some stuff, you destroy a part of the city, you destroy, you destroy the history of the people, and uh, transforming is actually a very good way. The city, when you look at it as an open ground, there's multiple ways on the rooftop, on the blind wall, underneath the bridges, in between the buildings, on, on the gaps, there's always uh, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of places where the, uh, a, parasite, uh, a parasite architecture can be put on. So the idea about that is more architectural hijack. It's such a strong protest, it's such a way to recreate uh, a schism, a city inside the city that it could bring out uh, it could totally bring out civil war. But if you decide to go by will, to recreate something new, then for me, the violence is getting legit.
So we need to find a whole new definition of living together. I've been working with tents all my life, from I was a kid. We had a whole competition in the neighborhood, in the back alleys. The guy who had the coolest tent, he, he had everything to say about, he had the power. So originally those tents were meant to comfort the life of three activists. It would give them a more comfortable stay during their actions in the, uh, during their occupations of the forest to stay there a very long time. Imagine this tent hanging very high in a trunk. Uh, you cannot put, cut down the trees. Imagine with loads of them, you cannot cut down the forest. And um, the activists still would have a comfortable stay. It was just designed by hanging a, a circular floor with a rope against the trunk. And then you were walking against this rope, so I designed a, a bypass so you can still um, move around in this tent. It's very spacious. Four meters high and uh, 260 in diameter. Uh, the frame, the weight of the steel frame is uh, 300 kilos. A tent is our common house. It's not a house, but our common house. So that makes a difference. A house is immediately closed. It's closing everything. It's not inviting. So it's inviting and it pays respect to the, to the privacy of people. Creating your own space uh, being able to live wherever you, uh, you want, uh, having some kind of comfort uh, in the middle of uh, nowhere. That is giving my working practice a goal for the rest of my life. In a city to work with uh, public spaces it's always a problem. Well, look here in, in the middle of the nature. It's just a calm and easy uh, project here. You're hanging there free from the ground and free from the trunk, just in the space. And the space is all around you. That is what I experience here very much and which I'm looking for in my work. How we relate to each other, how we turn around each other. Most of life is happening in uh, houses, of course, in the pubs, in the cafes, but that is still not a free, not only a free public space. Find a free public space where, where people from, from all uh, of the, the city, all layers of the society are, are, are be able to come together in a free way. That's, that's not an easy easy uh, thing we can do and most of the time we don't succeed in this. So I think there's still a lot, a long way to go to design cities.
in, uh, in this way. Maybe more with textile. It would be great. If you get used to a more confined space for your everyday living situation, you can, you can really cheat some of the repressive forces in society. Most ch children love to build like a little uh, cave or something, an enclosed space where you can hide away from the grown-ups and so forth. I'm still doing that. I'm just making them a little bit bigger. Snail shell system is a very radical way of uh, creating a home that you could actually roll around yourself in front of you. You could also use it as a raft to cross a river or a harbor or something like that. It was inspired, I was staying at the Greenland and I was uh, studying the traditional Inuit culture. In the winter time they would uh, build igloos and we build like a whole village, a whole city, in hours with the uh, under snow sort of passages and roads. And they would live there for like temporarily for three or four months and then would split up again. And they would do the same thing the next winter. So I was fascinated by the mobility and the temporary uh, sort of character of this kind of uh, the dwelling system. And I wanted to introduce a similar system. But I think the most important way it influences people is that it starts to make them think about their own situation. And, and if you compare like the average sort of middle class citizens in the Western world's normal living situation with a nomadic lifestyle, it's very different. I'm very interested in finding ways of existing with a small concentration of power possible. That means that we have to get rid of land ownership, we have to get rid of large uh, bank loans, all those things that keeps us in one position in our life, that uh, prevents us from using uh, a large amount of our time uh, to be nice to our children and to be nice to other people and to play with other people. I want, I'm constantly chasing ways of existing that would free myself from the normal economical system that would uh, keep me in a fixed position in order to pay my bank loans and so forth. My walking house is a very peaceful way of existing, where you have a very small footprint. You can move around without owning the land and stuff like that. It's a very different way of living. It's a very uh, different social way of existing. It's about trying to introduce other way of thinking and other way of living and to start up discussions and give people an experience of something different. And I think the chance of creating a better world, uh, saying I want to create a better world, is uh, much bigger than if we don't want to create a better world. I try to introduce some kind of hope in thinking about our future. The thing that, that would normally always happen when I do something in public space, uh, because it's different, people get attracted to it, and that's the starting point of uh, communication. 
on many different levels. People get an experience, uh, they feel something in the situation, they may feel some kind of significance in the situation, and you start talking uh, together and, and you exchange experiences. And, and, uh, and that's what art is all about, that's what architecture is all about, that's what design is all about. And I think if you could just, you know, move things a little bit in another direction and make new things happen, then I think your mission is sort of accomplished. Well, shelter is the most basic human need. A sleeping bag dress is a kimono type dress that when inflated, it changes into a cylinder or a cocoon in which a person can sleep. It comes very much from my personal experiences, moving from different countries, moving through different languages, sort of brought up a lot of questions about belonging. Where is my home? It has a solar panel incorporated into it and a small computer fan, so the solar panel charges the battery and computer fan operates off the battery. Experimentation was always there. And the idea of belonging, the idea of shelter, the idea of space where we feel comfortable. But that mobility that this process creates, I think what I was after to, to capture this moment in a sense in between, because since I left Poland, um, it's always been being in between. Today, we are more free in terms of moving through those boundaries than before. I think traveling really is the best way of opening an eye to, to differences and then hopefully also become more tolerant to the differences. I was very much interested in the idea of nomadism and sort of which uh, denies the idea of homeland sort of as a place of belonging. I believe that the modern nomad is a person that doesn't uh, get stuck in a particular structures. With that comes certain open-mindedness. To feel connected, we, we, we don't need that much space. Maybe it's by contrast. I think the idea of being close to the body, it, it's sort of related also to the question, well, how much do you need? How much also comfort do you need? So you are protected, you are kind of isolated, but at the same time, you are part of the environment. My expression presents the idea of home that is basically anywhere. Home is where you are.
I still share <laughs> the 60s, you know, fascination with technology and a belief in technology and in bettering the world. I mean, the technology showed alternative possibilities of, of living. And perhaps people can imagine that there are different possibilities to what they are used to. That opens this flexibility of imagination, including how we perceive the world. <laughs> 